Joining us today here in the USIP studios is Mr. Gordon Peake. He's an author and expert on all things Pacific Islands, amongst other things, and specifically he knows a lot about Papua New Guinea. Gordon, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Andrew. Nice to be here. For us today, could you please help explain um, how instability, insecurity, and fragility uniquely manifest in Papua New Guinea? Sure. It's great to be here, Andrew, and um, really grateful for the opportunity and really enjoyed the trip that we made. Um, to, to Papua New Guinea, which is a place that for many Americans is a real kind of far away, over the horizon sort of, sort of place. Um, we're asleep whenever they're awake. We're awake whenever they're asleep. It's half of the, of the second largest island in the world, the island of, of New Guinea. It's a two hour flight from Australia, and it's got a really unique kind of uh, colonial legacy as well. You've got a challenge of a state that has a limited reach, a state that has aspirations to do a lot, but has a fairly limited reach. You have a challenge of a growing population, and you have the challenge of an everyday uh, lack of sort of economic development that you can see there. So when we were in uh, PNG, we traveled into some of the, um, the, the settlements, kind of, you know, you would, shanty areas, you would say, in, 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 in other contexts where a lot of Papua New Guineans li live. And they go there looking for work and they don't find work. And I think that's one of the greatest everyday challenges um, that Papua New Guineans faced. And that manifests then in lots of everyday security challenges. Other challenges are um, relate to what you would probably sort of character most sometimes gets glossed as tribal fighting, which sometimes gets glossed as one group contesting against another challenges over uh, resources, uh, challenges that, that relate to, you know, sort of broader socioeconomic development. And also Papua New Guinea has got a unique challenge because it has, in 2019, just before the world ended or seemed to sort of shut down because of COVID, um, a, the, a set of islands on the eastern fringe of Papua New Guinea called Bougainville voted in a referendum, and 97.7% of Bougainvillians voted in that referendum to secede from Papua New Guinea. Only South Sudan um, has a referendum where a higher number of people voted to secede. So you've got a number of challenges. You've got everyday challenges of insecurity that kind of manifest in uh, places like Port Moresby, the capital. It's a place where there's a kind of heavy kind of private security presence where there's not a lot of people feel comfortable walking the streets. But you've also got these kind of broader political challenges that, that are facing the place as well, a want away region, and then the potential, uh, what the Papua New Guinea government worries about is the kind of domino effect that might come with that. Now, whether that's a warranted concern or not is another matter, but you've got this, a whole kind of accordion full of, um, of, of challenges and a state that's not particularly well prepared to, to, to meet them. You started off by saying, you know, there, there's limitations to state authority and that, that, that leads to some of the problems we see with security and, and governance issues. Can you tell us more about where these problems are in, in, in the country um, and, and how this might lead to violence that, that, that the Papua New Guineans have been seeing over the past years? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I, mean, I often think it's a useful way to think about Papua New Guinea almost sort of through sort of two lenses, one of which is through the thinking of the kind of formal state. And if you think of the formal state, you don't really, it's cause for kind of dis discouragement in a way because the state is limited. When you actually go to, tr go to the offices of the state, sometimes you find that there's not a lot of people that are there. You find that there's you know, lots of kind of boxes and files and um, activities, but not a lot of people. Um, that, that are there. And it's a state that isn't delivering very, very much uh, for its people, and that kind of manifests um, as well. At the same time, and it's really important to recognize that Papua New Guinea is not the kind of the bleak story that we sometimes think that it is. It's a place of tremendous resilience, uh, which is a buzzword that is used too, used too much. But I think in this case, it's actually warranted. Um, and that's because underneath the state and working through the state, are these kind of thousands and thousands of kind of river, rivers or rivulets of personal relationships. And it's personal relationships that keep the country uh, running in the, in the way that it does in a kind of stop, start, chugging along, um, imperfect sort of way. 
Um, but the challenge, I think, for kind of that then presents itself, Andrew, for for kind of countries like the United States or countries like Australia that are kind of wanting to work on fragility challenges is sometimes we automatically think, we kind of see like states, we kind of think, oh, we need to kind of work with the state in order to kind of address uh, fragility concerns, whereas actually the greatest source of strength in Papua New Guinea is, is with sort of beyond the state. There are you know, we met some of them on our, on our trip. We met, there's thousands, tens of thousands of kind of unsung heroes that are doing often unpaid work. Uh, they're working with um, helping victims of violence. They're helping victims of kind of sorcery accusation related violence, which is a sort of major growing problem in the country. We'll, we'll talk about that um, going up, up. But they're helping kind of lay little bridges between each other in order for the place to um, to work the way that it does. Local partnership is really important, but sometimes we kind of see like states. We you know we look towards, um, you know, the Department of Defense looks towards the Defense Forces and PNG, the, the FBI might look towards the police. The challenge in a place like PNG is we've got to kind of look beyond our, um, look beyond our kind of, our kind of traditional blinkers and see that the source of strength there and the sort of areas to work with is within this kind of relationality, this relational state um, that exists. And you and I saw that. Um, you and I saw that when we were when we were there. We traveled to a a, a place, uh, the second city of Papua New Guinea, which is Ley. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of a Pittsburgh is sort of industrial place with a kind of sort of dine at heel sort of charm to it. Um, and we met communities that were actively and practically working to try to sort of snuff out uh, violence that, that was occurring. Now they weren't work, they were sometimes working with the state, but they were often kind of working off their own bat, not being paid, not really being recognized by the state. And these are the kind of communities that are actually kind of working really productively and actively um, to stop violence. Indeed, we, we, we visited some remarkable communities and met some remarkable people. And to that, and to the point of uh, activities being locally led and partnerships being really um, centered around the, the partners and the countries we're trying to help, can you explain a little bit about the unique sort of uh, culture and traditions and customs in, in Papua New Guinea and, and what that means for, for partnering with them? Two things I think are really, are really important. The first is the importance of and sometimes we as kind of, you know, thinking it through Western lenses don't, don't think this way. We think there's something kind of wrong with this, but, um, but the importance of clan and tribe. Um, they've got these sort of huge family, family units that look out for each other. And it means that there's, um, I mean, I remember someone saying to me that there's one of the reasons why you see very few homeless people in Papua New Guinea is that there's these tremendously strong family, family units. Um, that kind of look out for each other, that support each other. Um, and so if you're in, in employment, sometimes kind of take a lot of money from you because it's a kind of communal, um, communal society. But that's one of the great, and sometimes we as kind of Westerners and Clans kind of think, oh, the clan, the tribe, or there's something kind of, you know, wrong about that. But actually, au contraire, it's one of the great sources of strength that is, that is in the country. And we saw that in, in our work. Uh, as well, which is people just practically and actively caring for their caring for their um, their kin. The second source of strength that's worth mentioning, and sometimes um, it, certainly in a place you know like I mean, I've come from Ireland originally, but I lived a lot of my life in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia, which is a fairly a religious um, place, is that Christianity plays a really important role in. Um, in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. It plays a really important sort of fostering community role and it also provides a set of kind of language and kind of rubrics um, that, that, that enable resolutions or enable sort of pathways um, to kind of you know, maybe not resolve conflict but in order to um, kind of sort of talk about conflict in a way. So let me give you one example. Um, PNG has got a, a um, 
just a terrible um, problem with violence against women. Um, somewhere between sort of 60 to 70 percent of women have suffered some form of sexual violence um, in their lives, if I remember the statistics correctly. Traditionally, uh, donors have worked with the, the victims of, of domestic violence, and that's completely correct uh, and appropriate. So by providing safe houses, but by providing hospital care for those as well. But a, a number of these kind of unsung heroes, these kind of peace builders that we talk about, people who don't really get a lot of attention because they're, they're kind of squirreled away and living in kind of settlements and sort of far away from the tarmac road. They started using the language or they sort of saying, well, it's, it's really important that we work, work with victims of domestic violence. But that's addressing the, the symptoms and not the cause. And the cause of domestic violence in kind of 99.99% .99 of cases is men. Um, often the kind of disenfranchised men that we spoke about earlier on who are kind of um, just unhappy at their, at their socioeconomic lot, so, and especially in a country that's kind of, it's a pretty expensive country as well. It's an expensive country to make ends meet. And so these kind of unsung peace builders have taken to using kind of Bible verse and a kind of theology and sort of theological concepts in order to kind of work with men, in order to try to get at what are the sources of their, um, of their kind of frustration, their, their rage. I, I, did, I did also uh, take note that, that there was recent violence and, and instability related to, to the elections. Yeah. And um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? It's a winner take all system. And it means that it's really important because if you get into parliament, you get accesses, access to resources. And resources means that you can build your, build your political power and that you can reward your supporters. Um, and so that means it's incredibly tense time um, in a winner take all system. It's like the US system, there's a winner and there's a loser. There's no proportional representation there for you to get into parliament. Um, and that creates a kind of flashpoint and a kind of source of, you know, a, an open wound that kind of continues all through this election process. Because like in any election, there's going to be one winner, but there's going to be plenty of losers. So that's sort of problem number one. Couple that with the fact that you've got a, you've got a kind of rickety, sort of out of date, um, sort of imperfect, you know, pick your, you know, pick your kind of sliding scale of um, comments about it, electoral rule, which means that, that many Papua New Guineans, there's some estimates nearly as many as half of Papua New Guineans, um, though we await the kind of results of um, election obso observation on this, were not able to vote. Um, so you can imagine just what a, how, you know, frustrating um, that would be. The challenge is sort of how you go about um, kind of addressing that. And one of the tricky challenges, I think, is how do you convince Papua New Guinea's political elite, who are the people who've kind of won the election, or have kind of you know, got into power, um, that it's in their interests to, uh, you know, to, to, to change that. Um, it's, I think that's one of the kind of the, you know, the, the, the issues that's kind of going forward. And we could see in our time in, in Ley, Andrew, some of the kind of hangovers off that, um, off that violence was taking place. We had a security guard in, 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 in Ley, and he told us, you know, after we held a community meeting where the community talked about how some homes had been burnt, he said, yeah, you know, I was one of those people who had their, their homes burnt. So, you know, violence can come, and losing really important things in your life can come really, really close to home. To flip it around in another way, we know that there's going to be an election in 2027. There's not going to be an earlier election. It's sort of constitutionally mandated to happen every five years. To me, that's a kind of golden opportunity to actually sort of have a kind of time horizon in front of you and think, um, I think, you know, think how can one work on this? Again, though, I think it'll also be one of these kind of litmus tests as well with the Papua New Guinean political elite. Are they interested in kind of changing the system because there's an argument that some of it of this kind of system kind of suits them because they emerge as, as winners of it? So 
we we would be remiss not to talk about what you what you opened one of the aspects that you opened with, and that is the uh, the issues surrounding the the Bougainville uh, political process and. And uh, I must mention that you have a book coming yes, out. Yes, I would be remiss in not pointing out that I have a book coming <laughs> out as well. <laughs> on Bougainville. So please, could you just tell us about this, this, this crisis, as they call it, and, and the peace process that, that followed and, and where we are now? It is the lo was the largest scale conflict in the Pacific since the Second World War. And it had many drivers to it. Um, it had a sort of resource component to it. Um, it had kind of everyday, uh, you know, sort of rubs and annoyances that kind of sort of boiled over. Um, but it also has an independent, has a, a, a national, nationalist kind of component to it as well, a sense among Bougainvillians that, uh, that they would be, um, that they were different from elsewhere in, in Papua New Guinea. So the conflict um, went from 1988 until uh, sort of ceasefires and the sort of just after sort of 1997, 1998, and culminated in a peace agreement in 2001. And the peace agreement is kind of relatively unique in a way because it has, unlike a lot of peace agreements which are kind of implemented really quickly, this one has been implemented over the course of the last um, you know, 20 years. Three components of the peace agreement, uh, the establishment of an autonomous government that was established in 2005, uh, weapons disposal, and a referendum on the, on the region's political future. It would be, a, as per the terms of the peace agreement, which is again a, an unusual construction, not, not unique because it's based on the, uh, the model that was used for East Timor, there would be a non-binding referendum, and then the parliament of Papua New Guinea would ultimately decide on on what would happen since. The big question now is sort of what happens next? Um, and it's a question, it was kind of a tidal wave of kind of, not, of sort of emotion and commitment among Bougainvillians that kind of got them to the point where they were able to deliver this almost unanimous sort of peaceful referendum. Now it's a question of kind of bureaucratic mechanics and kind of working out the process by which um, PNG and Bougainville sort of agree the terms of a, of a divorce. Thank you, Gordon, for that. Thank you for, for your description of Bougainville, which, which you know, to, from my experience, is a fascinating case study in, for many parts of peace building, um, the implementation of this, this, this peace agreement. And thank you for painting this picture uh, of Papua New Guinea, which pointed out you know, some of the struggles that they're having and, and de definitely a, a, a fragile situation, uh, violence, instability, and, and, but, but seeds of hope. No worries. Nice to be here.